Coming up on today's airport, it was a great big weekend for commercial space. There's been some interesting follow-up to our three-part interview with new AOPA boss Mark Baker and two Robinson R66s fly around the world. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. I'm Jim Campbell. Both I and ANN editor Tom Patton are standing in for Ashley Hale, who is married to her sweetheart Jordan Spradley over the weekend. So, as we said, we've decided to let her have a few days off, but just a few. But then again, we're not quite sure when she's coming back. We'll see. At any rate, while Ashley is on her honeymoon, we'll be updating you on the major stories of the week as they occur and concentrating mostly on the most important stories of the moment. Well, let's get to it, folks. As we noted, it was a great week for a number of folks in the commercial space transport biz. After a week's delay in orbit due to software hiccups, Orbital Cygnus vehicle successfully docked at the ISS. The station's Expedition 37 crew reported the spacecraft, loaded with about 1,300 pounds of cargo, berthed Sunday morning at 8.44 a.m. EDT, following an 11-day journey to the orbiting laboratory. Cygnus had been scheduled for a rendezvous with the space station on September 22nd, but due to a data format mismatch, the first rendezvous attempt was postponed. Orbital Cygnus was launched on the company's Antares rocket on September 18th from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport Pad 0A at NASA's Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. This was the first flight of a spacecraft to the space station from the state. The capsule will remain attached to Harmony until a planned unberthing on October 22nd sends a spacecraft toward a destructive reentry in the Earth's atmosphere. And a little closer to Earth, at least for a little while, a much modified version of SpaceX's Falcon 9, call it Falcon 9 1.1, launched at noon Sunday from Vandenberg AFB along the coast of California. A larger and more powerful version of the now experienced Falcon 9 launch vehicle, it placed a Canadian satellite into Earth orbit in what was labeled as a, quote, nominal, unquote, launch. With a number of microsats as well as MDA Corp Science and ComSat mentioned previously, all the primary mission objectives appear to have been met handily, though some secondary objectives, including the reignition of the first stage propulsion system to learn the control of the vehicle's descent in advance of SpaceX plans to eventually fly a fully recoverable launch system, ran into some issues that will require further test and evaluation. Well, folks, after 2,100 suggestions for questions to be put to the new boss at AOPA, we expected a lot of feedback on our three-part interview with Mark Baker. And boy, you did not disappoint us. However, a number of you seem to be a little bit disappointed in his answers. While many listeners and readers thought Baker sounded pleasant enough, there were a lot of concerns expressed over his willingness to dodge certain aspects of certain questions and the lack of specificity about well-known concerns and problems with the association. Many thought his comments about the FAA not being the enemy were off the mark and that many in aviation, looking over recent years of uh, FAA actions and decisions, have decided that the agency is anything but our friend. Evading more specific responses about AOPA competing with other aviation businesses, as well as his lack of knowledge about LSAs and related sport aviation matters, and his unwillingness to critique the previous leadership, and a number of other factors, left many feeling that Baker might wind up being Craig Fuller too, which no one seems to want. There seemed to be a desire for a more aggressive tone, more assertive actions, much more transparency, and the total dodge about his compensation package, which will be disclosed regardless within a year or so uh, due to public records requirements, unsettled hundreds of people that responded to ANN. As always, we'll continue to engage AOPA and we'll report back to you what we learn. Remember, folks, it's the duty of a patriot to question authority, and we will. Yes, folks, you're watching Airborne. More in a moment. Since its inception, Redbird Flight Simulations has been dedicated to developing new training technologies and processes in an ongoing effort to make aviation safer, more affordable, and more accessible. Consider Redbird's flagship flight training device, the FMX, a superior quality, full motion, feature-rich advanced aviation training device priced with real-world flight training organizations in mind. With standard features that are anything but standard, such as wraparound visuals, a fully enclosed cockpit, quick change configurations, scenario-based training compatibility, and of course, an electric motion platform, the FMX serves up a level of realism that is simply unavailable in other training devices on the market. 
For more information on Redbird flight simulations, the Redbird FMX, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne, Aero TV, our podcast, or our website, or any part of our galactic empire, drop an email to news-spy at aero-news.net. The FAA is considering mandating the replacement of some older Honeywell PFD and MFD devices installed in Boeing 737 and 777 aircraft due to a potential interference problem with certified onboard Wi-Fi systems. The move comes as the agency is also considering relaxing rules that currently prohibit use of electronic devices below 10,000 feet. The Wall Street Journal reports that the interference potential has been acknowledged by both Boeing and Honeywell following laboratory tests conducted in conjunction with GoGo, which manufactures onboard Wi-Fi systems. The interference, which can cause the displays to temporarily flicker or blank out entirely, has not been reported on any actual flights, but has been replicated in tests. Boeing and Honeywell have installed cockpit displays with enhanced shielding in newer aircraft, and have recommended replacement of older models on a voluntary basis, though the entire fleet has not been updated. A draft document reportedly would give airlines a five-year time frame to replace the devices. For Airborne, I'm Tom Patton. Today's Aero Video of the Week is all about the wonder of flight. And no matter what you fly or prefer to fly, I dare anyone to look at this extraordinary sunset trike flight and not wish that you were there. Lovingly shot, accompanied by a terrific audio score, this flight will make your day. It sure made ours. The four and a half minute video can be found on YouTube by searching Swab Flight in Sunset. Our friends at Boeing have hit a home run and WestJet moves toward modernization and expansion by adding the Boeing 737 MAX to its fleet. The order, valued at 6.3 billion at list prices, consists of 4737 MAX-8s and 25737 MAX-7s. The airplanes are a key component of the Calgary-based airline's fleet renewal initiative. Boeing says the WestJet order continues the momentum of the 737 MAX in the marketplace. This order brings the total number of 737 MAX orders to date to 1,567 airframes. On September 15th, a pair of Robinson R-66 turbine helicopters landed at the Bunkovo heliport just outside Moscow marking the end of a six-week around-the-world expedition. The historic flight was a first for the R-66 and for Russia. The expedition was organized by Avia Market, a Robinson dealer in Moscow, and a flying club whose members own the helicopters. The journey began on August 2nd when four pilots, along with a documentary filmmaker, departed the Bunkovo heliport flying west. The two helicopters crossed Europe and then the North Atlantic Ocean, with the leg from Greenland to Newfoundland, Canada, marking the longest day of the expedition, 12 and a half hours in the air. The helicopters traveled just north of the U.S. border to Vancouver before setting course for Alaska. They then crossed the North Pacific Ocean to Siberia and finally back to Moscow. In total, the teams crossed four continents and two oceans, traveled 24,512 miles, and logged 220 flight hours, both R-66s were outfitted with auxiliary fuel tanks to extend their range. In April, two of the same pilots flew an R-66 to the North Pole. For Airborne, I'm Tom Patton. Captain James Tiberius Kirk, better known to the rest of us as actor William Shatner, decided to remain grounded on terra firma rather than take a seat on Virgin Galactic Spaceship Two. When asked why, he stated that he does not pay $200,000 for a space flight. He gets paid especially if there are no safe return guarantees involved. According to Sir Richard Branson, CEO of Virgin Galactic, there are no freebies, no matter how famous the passenger is. Shatner, whose character Captain Kirk warped over far-flung galaxies, fighting Klingons and romancing green alien babes, is apparently a little bit yellow about real space flight, according to Sir Richard. Who knew? He was told Shatner is even queasy about airline travel. However, we bet that Chatner's recent Denny Crane character would have bought out the entire flight, especially if the flight included a green space check hostess. But has anybody called Mr. Spock? Okay, folks, as you know, Airborne's going to be on kind of a different schedule while Ashley is off on her honeymoon. 
will be hosting a series of updates as required by breaking and other important news while Ashley's away. But you can always get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories by logging on to www.aero-news.net. Please remember the Airborne is streamed twice weekly and is always online. When we return to a normal schedule in a few days, you can join us every Tuesday and Friday for a new edition of Airborne. And by the way, folks, come the beginning of the year, you'll see us three times a week. I'm Jim Campbell. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon.